Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for our Bloom webinar on PTSD. So I'm Allison and I'm here with Hera. And for those who don't already know, um, we're facilitators for Bloom, which is our new free web-based support service, which is run by Chen. Now, Chen is a volunteer-run network that creates intersectional resources for survivors of abuse around the world. And as for our Bloom project, we've designed it for anyone who is currently experiencing or has experienced domestic or sexual abuse. And we're offering support over five courses. So this is meant as a little taster of what you would get from one of those five courses, where we offer tips, tricks, tools, and comforting words to our community. And working through one of those courses will involve learning, reflecting, and processing how what we've experienced has affected us, but in a safe and empowering space, just like this one where we talk to you, we put together videos, we communicate and have dialogue one-on-one. -on -one. And all of the courses will also be delivered anonymously within a group setting and alongside other survivors. And we will be using Telegram or WhatsApp, not like Demio right now where we're talking to you live, but uh, that's another one of the reasons just recreating that space in this webinar, why we've asked all of you to use a fake name to protect everyone's privacy. Uh, and I'm looking over to see anyone else's name here. We have Cool, which I like having that sort of descriptor so I can see there's some creativity. Yes, and so this is Hera. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about something so important. And um, if there's still time to change your name if you want, because the session is being recorded, so we're not going to take your names uh, unless it's like a, it's a, obviously a cartoon or some other fictional name. Uh, so we're we'll say that your name then. So we, as Allison said, we want to show you how our courses run, give you a taste for them. So this one is about PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, and we're also going to be talking about CPTSD, which is mm -hmm are known and it's complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Today's session is going to flow in a very similar way to our courses so we want to give really give you the feeling as if you're with us on that journey and we're so we're going to dive right in. So uh, we're going to discuss PTSD and how it develops so we have some goals for the sessions we explain exactly what we're going to cover in the session. Allison tell us what what do we have on? So at the start of every session, like Kara said, we go through goals. So today we're going to explain how we develop post-traumatic stress disorder. We're going to explain the difference between PTSD and CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. We're also going to list their common symptoms. And then we're going to explain the difference between the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, which don't worry, you don't have to remember the full name, uh, but we'll explain um, engaging in our bodies why relaxation techniques that we go through are so great at um, shutting down the effects of post-traumatic stress, triggers, anxiety. And we're also going to outline multiple at-home methods to prevent and interrupt those triggers, as well as very briefly just mention a few professional services, which might be best for you. But um, when we actually go into the course, we discuss them a little bit more in depth. Just for time here, we'll move along through that pretty quickly. Is the condensation of two sessions. The way it works in Bloom is that we have, uh, you get two videos every week, um, session one, session two, and there's a homework at the end of each video. So you're supposed to send the homework to us, discuss it over with us, uh, do the self-reflection in time for the second video. So this session is like a combination of two without that break in between, uh, just so you know how it would run. And uh, we mm -hmm. do besides that um you know not everyone lives in a safe environment and we recognize that because of the work that we do but this doesn't mean that the tools and tricks that we're going to discuss with you today won't work for you even if your everyday day-to-day -day environment isn't safe you know remember that your body is safe with you and you know there are still methods that you can use to give yourself the love respect and care that you truly deserve and not just to like become stronger or something different, but because you know you can experience and appreciate the way you are right now. So um, every week or every video, actually, we start off with a grounding exercise, and these are exercises that actually like 
literally ground you um, and help you come back to the present moment. So uh, we do a different one at each video. So that way, by the end of every course, you've got a bunch of ones that you know you like or ones that you're not sure about, but you've tried them all. And then those can be handy for you. So today's ground exercise, uh, we're going to do, like Alison and I are going to do it with you. But what we'd love is for you to use the chat to write down some of the things we're going to ask you to say. So uh, I'm going to go through them one by one with all of us. So you can join us in the chats and Alison and I will I'll pick out things that you say as well. Uh, right. And uh, worth saying that uh, Alison uh, may have mentioned this, but uh, we have two members who are also in the chat with us. There's Zoe and Tiffany who are in the chat and you'll see that they're moderators and they'll be, they can answer any questions that you have. So the first, um, so this ground exercise is the five, four, three, two, one method. So like we're mm -hmm. going through five things and then four things and three things and two things and one thing. <laughs> so the first thing is um, search for five things you can see. So mm -hmm. Alison, tell me, why don't you do this one and then I'm going to do the next one. So I have um, just above my fireplace that I'm facing a seashell that I picked up from the beach back when we were kind of able to access the sea in that way that I can see. I have some flowers that desperately need some new water. Um, I have a postcard from a friend that I saved that's again on that same mantelpiece. I have, oh goodness, I have a, a lamp I need to dust. Um, <laughs> and I also have a little cork bottle from um, champagne that I saved uh, from probably some some dinner. You would think that by saving the cork bottle, it would you'd remember what event it was, but I think it, was it wasn't that special then. <laughs> So, things that I see. Okay. So the next thing is search for four things that you can touch. So I'll do this one. Four things I can touch. I've got my Fitbit um, and a pencil cap from a hotel that I love. And I love having meetings in that hotel or staying in that hotel so that I can take all their pen caps. And you know, the cool thing is the pen actually says, steal this one away to write a letter of love. Really? How cool. They know people steal pens, so they don't consider them stealing. They actually give them away. So nice. <laughs> and so that's two things. And mm -hmm. then I have a silk um, point tail and I have uh, a post-it. Post-it that we actually made for uh, one of our courses. I recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here. So um, that's that. And then the next thing is Search for three things that you can hear. So, Allison, what can you hear? And let's see if someone's told us in the chat. Can you tell us three things that you can hear? Yeah, I want to hear that. I think right now I have that constant whirring from the laptop, where you're making sure it's not overheated. Because in the UK we've we've had very crazy weather, so I think my technology is struggling to keep up. Um, I can also hear the distant drone of cars, and uh, it's not happening right now, but uh, outside my window, um, just a little bit before we started the webinar, I could hear someone walking their dog. So you have those like small yeah. tic tacs along the cobblestone, which always um, helps ground me and settle me back in the moment of knowing what space that I'm in. Oh, and you know, just like that, someone in the chat has said that they can hear their AC unit. How much I envy you, if only you could figure <laughs> out. Uh, another person says the AC unit. Yes, we uh, are full of envy for you because there is no such thing as AC in the UK. No one like anticipates that the like it to be so hot, so they don't build it like that. No. So um, we both of us, Alison and I, are living in the UK, but are not from here. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and and someone can hear birds and people laughing. That's nice. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is search for two things that you can smell. What can I smell? Uh, at the moment, I feel like I can smell heat. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. possible, but I can smell heat. <laughs> it's my, the smell of my body burning in this heat. That's the first smell. I the mean, second, sizzle yeah. kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like my hair saying, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. So and the other thing I can smell is I just made um, a refreshing uh, yogurt drink. It's called Lassi, and we drink it in Pakistan to keep ourselves cool. So I had it just before the swell because I knew that, you know, I just wanted to like be, feel fresh. So I can, I can smell the yogurt in the air. Oh, that's so nice. Ooh, and I use some cardamom in it so that I can smell that too. Ooh, someone can smell lavender and macadamia oil. 
Very nice. And who is showing off with the fresh air of Pacific Northwest? Love that. Oh, and you can smell your dog and coffee. See, oh, I love it. I, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so I'm really jealous right now as we sit. You are truly jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and last thing. So the last thing is one thing, which is one thing that you can taste. So I think mm -hmm. you all know what I can taste. I can taste the yogurt drink. Let's see, <laughs> because I just had it. What about you, Alison? Uh, I, I, I'm, see, the taste one is one of those things that I love because it really does center you. But mm -hmm. I've just had water. So I'm, I'm kind of struggling to think of how I would describe that tastelessness. I think you have something cool and fresh, though, that's still... I think that's a quite important conversation in itself. Some yeah. people think they can, like water has a taste, and other people think that it doesn't, that it doesn't taste like anything. I think water has a taste. So, yeah, um, yeah interesting. <laughs> so um, just like we do our grounding exercises, we also do a fun exercise, which is just to kind of, you know, we've done the grounding, and now we want to think about something else. So Alison, have you got a fun exercise for us? Fun yeah. question. So the fun question that we have, we actually asked recently in a Chen volunteer call. So I'm really <laughs> eager to like spread it out is what is a food that you love that people might find odd? So when we had the conversation in our group, we had, I, I'm trying to remember, we had some we like, had so many crazy things. I mean, yeah. the thing is like crazy to who? That is the question, right? Because, you know, some people were finding lots of synergies. So I think we had two volunteers mm -hmm. who both found synergies in having McDonald's uh, fr French fries with yeah. the ice cream. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Milkshake yeah. or like the blizzard, not blizzard, um, the frosty or whatever and dipping it in. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, this is again one of those things where when you come to the UK, it's a culture clash. I have started to mix when I have fries or chips, uh, mayonnaise with ketchup to create that like weird sauce. And it led us on a spiral of discovering all of these branded sauces like Cranch, which is ketchup and ranch, and like <laughs> mayo stirred or something, which is mayo and mustard. <laughs> yeah, mayo ketchup. Um, I, mine was cumin biscuits. They're sweet biscuits, like shortbread biscuits, but like mm -hmm. very buttery, but they have cumin in them. Um, and when I took it to the co-working space that I work from, people were like shocked. They were like, they could not have fathomed that combination. And I grew up eating them. So for me, it was like very, very like, like usual. So I actually took it with me and got everyone to taste it and everyone loved it. So only one person was like, that's a bit weird. I put cumin in my like, you know, like sour food or like non-sweet food. It's so, good, yeah, it's interesting. So let's see what we've got in the chat. Have we got some interesting thing? Gefilte fish. Oh, gefilte fish. Yes, I, I, I think that is. We have uh, Zoe says crisps and chips with anything, sweet things, milkshakes. Mm -hmm. Zoe, you are banned from all Chen events. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. No, it's just. It's fine, as you know now that you have at least two other people in Chen who uh, also enjoy uh, a suite of things with fries. So you, you have company. Um, amazing. So shall we kick off with uh, our content for today? Yeah. So when obviously we're, we're talking about post-traumatic stress today, which is one of our heavier topics. So we encourage anyone who is a part of our session or video or here today that Again, if you need to disengage a little bit and use your grounding exercise and stay present, that's totally fine. But we will be talking through it in a way that is hopefully accessible and collaborative and safe. And as we start to talk about post-traumatic stress, it's important for us to talk about what trauma really means to clarify the effects and explain why it lingers and lasts with us. So at its root, trauma is known as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. But more specifically, it's one that either threatens our lives or damages our sense of security or self in a profound way. So when we survive something terrible, we learn about the ways that we're unsafe in the world. A traumatic experience is something or a time outside of our control. Exactly. You know, your body is constantly working to keep uh, you alive you know keep us alive and breathing eating sleeping you know our body wants us to live um, and is working for it and our brains are no less part of that system 
So that's why when we um, think of difficult memories or when difficult memories repeat themselves, uh, it's because our mind wants to make sure that whatever happened doesn't happen to us again. You know, it wants to solve what went wrong and how could we prevent it. And as a result, we become hypervigilant, um, alert and constantly searching our environment for similar and potential danger. You know, we can see why our mind does that, but we can also see how that can be problematic for us living our lives, you know. Um, but we can also shut down and completely avoid our um, things that remind us of that traumatic time. You know, it's really exhausting doing that much thinking and feeling about something that's painful. Um, and for s some people, because they just forget, you know, it's a mean of protecting themselves uh, mm -hmm. against that memory and the impact of that memory. Yeah. and whether we're fixating or disassociating, which is again, forgetting or stepping out of our bodies in that way, they're both normal reactions to traumatic events, because again, it's something that threatened your life. And as our uh, bloom therapist, Paula says, who's been helping us work through the program, traumatic reactions are normal responses to very abnormal situations. But the issue with post-traumatic stress disorder is that the feelings that you had in that traumatic event and situation don't go away. Mm -hmm. So as we begin to think about our past over and over, it makes that past feel literally like it's happening in the present, mentally as well as physically. Because, and this was amazing to me when I found out, the brain can't always distinguish between a memory and the reality around you. So if you're remembering that terrifying event your danger signals will flare as though the trauma were still happening and happening now. Fear takes over. We get locked into what we call survival mode. So you might have heard before about the three Fs. When you're in danger, you either fight, freeze, or flee. Um, so depending on how you're reacting to that danger, you might become combative. You might shut down. You might, again, try to run or back off from that threat. And we have that same physical sensation with all the hormones and inability really to think of anything else. And PTSD usually develops in the first six months um, after a traumatic event, but some symptoms can take years to form. And now as we're gonna go through a list of common symptoms or like signs, these signs wouldn't always mean that you have post-traumatic stress. So like, just remember that it may feel like it, but it may not be. Um, and, and these signs of like regular anxiety can sometimes be very similar to PTSD. Mm -hmm. So if you've experienced any of the, um, you know, examples that we've given um, right now, you know, please do speak to a professional for a more thorough assessment. This is not meant to replace, um, mm -hmm. replace professional help. So let's go through the symptoms of PTSD. So some of the very common reactions that most people with PTSD experience, although it doesn't need to be the whole list, you have flashbacks to what happened to you, either as intrusive thoughts, dreams, or nightmares. Uh, sometimes you, it's hard to connect with your emotions, so you feel unable to connect to others or enjoy the things that you love or used to love. You can also feel, as we mentioned, um, hypervigilant or on edge. So easily startled, always on watch, again, scanning the room for that danger and that repetition. And you can have a lack of concentration. It's hard to focus. There's also, I think, a lack of trust when your world has been shattered in the sense of reality. And sometimes then it's hard to have trust and faith in your close relationships, which is why victims can isolate from their loved ones. You can find yourself being more irritable than usual. There's outbursts of anger, crying, mood swings, having trouble falling asleep to begin with, uh, a loss of appetite or a change in eating patterns as well. And others can be extreme feeling of helplessness or horror, the inability to distinguish between the past and like the present, associating various words like or events or triggers back to your trauma like the sights and sounds and, you know, feelings that you associate with whatever happened, which takes you back there and you feel like you're re-experiencing what happened. Mm -hmm. you know, avoidance of anything that might cause these triggers, 
um, to occur could be situations or certain kinds of people or places or touch you know um, and your reaction could be like you know refusing to talk about it or pretending it never happened uh, being in denial or, or you know unable to manage details of a particular event a feeling of low self-esteem and confidence um, you know deep embarrassment uh, shame or guilt we often blame ourselves for what happened um, and you know if our trauma involves another person we can maybe also fixate on them becoming preoccupied with um, the perpetrator um, rather than looking after ourselves and whatever you may have experienced within that list of symptoms when we talk about ptsd it's good to know that we're talking about a single traumatic moment or event so the trauma comes from a one-time experience that made you threatened, afraid. So we're talking about instances of assault or a natural disaster. However, if your trauma happens over a repeated period of time in which there's no certain means of escape, so let's say you have your danger signals flaring, you're being told to keep yourself safe, to protect yourself, you're trying to run, freeze, or fight back to stay well, but in these situations, there's no clear answer about what would help you, such as in situations of domestic abuse or childhood neglect, or also if you're someone who's been living in a war zone. There's the different stress-related disorder um, from this circumstance, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder, or CPTSD. And CPTSD includes the symptoms of PTSD, but in addition to the above, it can also alter our perception of ourselves because we're in a situation in a daily environment where we're continuously coping with daily abuse and we're experiencing that threat and that trauma day after day after day. So just to give a quick recap within that, PTSD happens after a short-term trauma or experience. So a car accident, again, an assault, even the death of a loved one, natural disasters, or an experience of violence. We were unsafe, so we either relive or avoid the experience in attempt to fix the danger so we don't go through it again. And PTSD in this way tends to deal with the emotion of guilt. So we feel like we did something wrong and that if we revisit, recap, and review that event over and over and over again, we can find some way to fix it or not go through it. And it can make what happened then feel like it's happening now. So the past becomes present. Mm -hmm. And every day our bodies lock into that state of fight, flee, or freeze. And when it comes to CPTSD or complex PTSD, you know, this um, to recap happens after repeated or long-term trauma where there was no easy out, way out. Um, examples could be domestic abuse, sexual abuse, um, childhood neglect, bullying, uh, living in a war zone, being held captive. You know, uh, we don't believe we can fix the danger. Uh, we've learned helplessness over time. And mm -hmm. it strongly deals with shame, you know, that we, it's not that we've done something wrong, but we are in ourselves, something wrong is what we're wrong mm -hmm. and it includes symptoms of uh, PTSD a lot of them but also dangers our sen sense of identity and who we are because of course when you're managing those deep feelings of shame or helplessness you tend to falsely believe that you're responsible for your mistreatment and there's actually an explanation behind this and a reason why you develop those sense um, and experiences of shame. Because if you're in a position where you're being abused again and again and again, how, if you're trying to survive and live in the world, do you begin to make sense of that knowledge that you don't have authority or control of your life? Not just because their actions are cruel, but because you're in an environment where you can't break out. Again, you can't respond to those danger signals to alter what's mm -hmm. going on around you. If you were to be in that position and decide, well, there's nothing I can do, you would be forfeiting that sense of survival that is inherent in human biology and dignity. 
you would feel like you're doomed. There's no way to really survive if you think that the world is hopeless. Or if you're in an experience of domestic abuse, you have been worn down to the point where you don't think there's a world outside of that environment. So in either case, it actually becomes easier and it's a survival tool if we blame ourselves for the behaviors of other people or our circumstances. Absolutely. Because we are people who we can control. We can decide our actions. We can assess our situation. We can change how we're behaving. And if we believe in that way that we can then affect change, if we become the problem, it is something that we can fix and respond to. Yeah. And however difficult these signs or symptoms are, please know that your body mm -hmm. is doing everything that it could or can to keep you here alive. And you know, you are not the ways you've been hurt or how you have coped. That doesn't define you. There's a reason you feel the way that you do. Um, it's not a flaw, it's not a weakness. These diagnoses only prove how your body and your mind and you are already amazing. Um, and for complex PTSD, you know, you did not get to choose your earliest moments and those experiences and those memories and relationships. You know, you did what you could at that point. Uh, but, you know, I think it's important that we remind ourselves in that situation that you're no longer helpless. You know, and none of your feelings of shame are permanent, even if they feel like it. You know, we have the power to choose now who we are. Mm -hmm. So in the case of PTSD, then it's about reminding yourself and finding ways and tools and tricks in your space to remember that the past isn't the present. There are ways we can make ourselves feel safer, confident, and then feeling the present moment and where we are now moving forward yeah and the work now comes in guiding ourselves into healthier patterns so by making the past the past and to remember that the present uh, and what it is in order to build towards the future um, however difficult your symptoms and however they present themselves your symptoms and coping mechanisms are proof that you can do this and have done this before mm -hmm. and are built to be here you, know, you have already been resilient so covering through then that background, we wanted to discuss the methods that you can use to cope. So tools and practices which help essentially calm down those danger signals. The ones that um, can also help you distinguish the memory of that trauma and its triggers from the present. And it also helps us build trust in our bodies so we can move beyond that past. And again, towards the future, as we've mentioned. So we mentioned in our goals that we would go over professional treatment options for PTSD. Uh, we didn't wanna to spend too much time on this um, because we have the 45 minute window, but cognitive behavioral therapy in speaking with someone in an environment where it is safe physically around you as you process those past events is always useful and meaningful. Um, and it's, almost a narrative tool again to reestablish the ways that the past is past and your reality now is different even if those signs and memories can overlap with present triggers exactly and i think let's discuss like how things actually work in our mm -hmm. body you know let's discuss what happens when our body uh, mm -hmm. experiences danger and like our danger signs flare now, as we've said before, the feelings um, from the time of our trauma come back to us physically when we remember mm -hmm. a traumatic event. So like triggers uh, or flashbacks, this makes our body sweat, our thinking brain shuts down and we get heart palpitations or we can even feel fuzzy, like we mm -hmm. can't orient ourselves. When our brain tells us that we're in danger, it taps into one of our, the two nervous systems that we have. That's mm -hmm. our sympathetic nervous system, which is associated with that fight or flight response. You know, that's the way to remember it. It prepares the body to run, you know. However, we also have the parasympathetic system, which restores ourselves, which deals with sleep and digestion. Functionally, we're meant to work in rhythm between the two to keep our systems balanced. And the nervous system can restore itself and recommence its easy flow between both the reactive mode 
or the restorative mode. So it's just important to remember that you know our uh, our bodies are are wired to work uh, for mm -hmm. both rest and you know flight. So what ends up happening, of course, is when we're reviewing the danger signals and how it feels physically when we're anxious and we can't fall asleep because that sympathetic nervous system is on, is the trick of making our bodies relax because only one system can be on at any one time. So let's say we go through a breathing exercise. We have that other system start up because we're engaging with our bodies to tell our minds through its actions that where it is, is safe. And the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which controls that heartbeat, tension and stress, has to shut down. And you may have even found, uh, if you have struggled before with stress or trauma or PTSD, that you've already discovered ways to regulate your nervous system, to bring that parasympathetic back on, which we often call coping mechanisms. So eating is a way to calm yourself down, um, drinking non-alcoholic beverages, or even some of the more uh, dangerous ways um, or uh, really tools that we've used if we haven't had access to other things like self-harm are also ways to return to that state of rest. Um, and in this way, we have been trying to take care of ourselves. It's not just a random dangerous reaction. It's just, we didn't know that that what was what we were trying to do. And again, might've brought more shame on ourselves or had the resources to make the healthiest choices at the time. But hopefully knowing these tools now, you can step back from any of the more dangerous practices. And psychologists usually try to help people use insight and mm -hmm. uh, understanding to manage their behavior. However, research shows us that not all problems stem from a lack of understanding. Many originate uh, deeper uh, because mm -hmm. there are deeper memories in our brain that drive our perception, beliefs, and focus. So as we said, it's that emotional brain signals when mm -hmm. you're in danger that is made up of our experiences and what we've learned to fear. So that is why it can be helpful to find a trauma-informed therapist or professional to work with mm -hmm. um, if you choose to. But everyone is different. So if you do choose to see a psychologist, please make sure you find one that is right for you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, insight alone or knowing why something is happening isn't always enough to shut off the alarm. You know, the aim is in healing our traumatic symptoms is to recognize what is an emotional or internal signal mm -hmm. and learn how to attend to them and get our more rational brain online, not because the rational brain is more important, but because it works in harmony with our body. And we want to restore that balance between our brain and body to live a full um, and balanced life. That's a lot of balance I've said in the past minute. <laughs> But it's it's true because you are wanting to reestablish that harmony and sense of yourself and yeah. trusting both system to be working in the way that they should. And um, when it comes to reminding yourself of that balance at home uh, or managing uh, those danger signals or stresses and triggers um, to switch away um, back to our parasympathetic nervous system without professional assistance, um, we uh, are looking at those helping co um, healthy coping strategies to lessen the impact. So grounding exercises are a great example of that. Because again, as we went through almost that mantra over and over about how the past isn't present and we need to remind ourselves of the present to move forward, the grounding exercise is all about engaging in your physical environment, which isn't the traumatic event. It's not the experience of what you went through. It's somewhere new. It's using your physical body and senses and sight and sounds and touch to reaffirm that truth and reality and remind your brain that the memory is past. Or we're also looking at um, stress management. So that has a lot to do with boundaries. When you know something causes you stress and isn't necessary to your healing, you try not to bring it into your life. You're not in activating that fight or flight response to begin with. 
Uh, and we also, I'm sure you've heard whether or not you've watched uh, a yoga session or even in just common feedback about how breathing exercises and calming and regulating your breathing is also helpful to calm yourself down. And the best bit is that breathing exercises have been shown to decrease your reactions to stress in the long term. That means each time we're practicing deep breathing, it gets easier and easier for us to settle our anxiety and get back to feeling well, and it helps us in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, deep breathing involves slow and steady uh, breathing in and out. Um, you can also count in four and six out. Mm -hmm. um, and if we feel ourselves having a panic attack, it is mm -hmm. also important to regulate the amount of like um, oxygen we're getting in and then carbon dioxide that we are exhaling out. All of our excess breathing in um, pushes out this, the carbon dioxide from our lungs and that's what makes us feel lightheaded. Mm -hmm. You know, breathing, breathe out air has more carbon dioxide than, um, than ordinary air. So if you breathe it back in, the carbon dioxide will get into your lungs more quickly and prevent um, uh, hyperventilation. If you find yourself panicking and need to regulate yourself, you know, try the following steps. So um, do you want to show us how it works, Alison? Yeah. So first, you cup your hands together in front of you. You place them over your nose and mouth, so I'm sorry if I suddenly become a bit muffled. Uh, but when you keep them there, if you breathe in through your nose slowly and breathe out through your mouth, you're trapping that carbon dioxide that is releasing too quickly from your body when you're hyperventilating. And you're allowing yourself to breathe that back in and the exhaled air. So you keep the CO2 in your system. If you repeat that four times, it can help again, balance what's going on. And uh, you've probably even seen in films when somebody grabs a paper bag, it has the same effect. Um, so if you can also find a paper bag, you can repeat that same practice. Exactly. And relaxation techniques like these have the opposite effect on the body to our fear response, because mm -hmm. instead of feeling um, uncomfortable physical sensations of sweating or racing heartbeat, we lower our heart rate and rest the mind and mm -hmm. reduce that really icky feeling of like ten being tensed up. Um, by relaxing the body, you know, we may also be able to let go of our anxious thoughts and feelings and make sense of what triggered us and the reason why to lessen mm -hmm. like its control over us. So, you know, you, you've already may have practiced some of these relaxation techniques like um which you know you might have termed as self-care like um bubble bath singing allison what what is a relaxing thing for you i really love uh well doing um yin yoga which is our trauma sensitive yoga which is all mm -hmm. about gentle movements where you keep the poses for at least three minutes Mm -hmm. And it allows you to stretch because it's using the same techniques that we're going through, which is all about using your body to influence your mind rather than making everything cognitive and about knowledge and acquisition. You can actually engage with your muscles and your senses and your nerves to influence change the other way around. And um, I did it once. I haven't gotten to go back again, but it's also approved by the Department of Veteran Affairs as an effective complementary treatment for PTSD. Oh, um, wow. I'm sure to reduce feelings of stress. And um, also talking about uh, narratives from before journaling is always effective. Uh, mm -hmm. I found personally, I didn't mention at the start, but I, I have CPTSD. So journaling for me was a very powerful tool because again, it was allowing me to get all of my thoughts out into one place and know, as I reaffirmed, even going through my daily activities, that my past experiences aren't the same as what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Do you have more tips uh, for PTSD uh, on how we can you know, lessen the panic that uh, can come back with flashbacks and triggers mm -hmm. and getting into that state of relaxation? Mm -hmm. So again, going through looking after our bodies, it is always important to get enough sleep, uh, at least eight hours. I, I have to, I can't function otherwise. Eight to nine hours for me. <laughs> yeah, because 
I, I think there's still a part of me that wants to be teenaged and rebellious and thinks, oh, if I've stayed up till 3 a.m. or I'm only functioning on four hours of sleep and some <laughs> energy drink and like the bleachers, uh, that that makes me cooler. But really, it's, it's... if I sleep late, I just wake up late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you need the eight hours because in our in our word of the day, which is balance, you want to make sure that you have your nervous system online enough to go restore your cells, stay healthy, bring on your digestive tract, make sure that everything is functioning as it should, and even letting our memories settle. Um, for those who have had trouble falling asleep, a consistent bedtime is important. Just letting your mind do less work and figuring out whether or not something is safe, knowing that the hour that's happening is when it's meant to sleep. Or you can also put um, a little bit of honey in some warm milk which releases melatonin in your brain, which is a sleep chemical. It's the same chemical that comes from eating too much turkey at Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's a um, quality of practice that you have. Um, and I'm, another tip I would say in terms of if you find your jaw clenching quite a lot is if you lay your tongue flat on the roof of your mouth. So you're pressing the tongue tip not too hard against the tip of your teeth, and it's laying parallel. Um, Find that now. Yeah, you can't actually clench the back of your jaw if it's in that upwards position. So if you're finding that you're kind of gritting down for too long, putting your mouth in that position can help release that tension. And I mean, otherwise, I think one of the most important tips that people miss out on is also just talking about the community that you engage yourself in and yeah. make sure that you're not staying isolated. Exactly. Because, you know, it's really hard work doing this like introspective work, mm -hmm. uncovering, discussing, analyzing painful memories, and also the ways that that PTSD manifests in our life and how mm -hmm. it may be stopping us from living it the way we want it. And um, that is some, yeah, that can be really uncomfortable and like painful um, and it's, you know, uh, misery likes a friend, <laughs> but yeah. there's, it does. But also a positive way of thinking about it is that you're not alone in going through this experience. Other people are also going through it. So they might be feeling the same way. And you, you know, there, if, if other people are there with you, then you don't have to, especially those who have been through it themselves, then there's less of this, like, you feel less like there's an expectation that you need to have quick solutions and quick fixes. And, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes people are like, well, you know, you've gone to this session or you've gone to this therapist three, five times, you know, you should just like, why isn't it fixed by now? It's like not fixing, it's not fixing a car. It's something way different. So, you know, I just wanted to validate anyone who's heard that, that um, people being impatient with your recovery or you yourself being impatient with your recovery and knowing that um, that's sometimes things, things take time and mm -hmm. it's okay to give ourselves that time. Um, and, you know, even coming to a session like this, um, if you're watching a recording of this later, that coming to the Bloom courses or thinking about the ways that, you know, help you in moments of crisis and practicing them again and again, these are all ways for you to, um, you know, to, to help yourself and to improve your quality of life because that's really important, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, but the thing, the most important thing that we want to say is that you know a lot of these things are really helpful for day-to-day -day management. But if you have really strong um, symptoms or signs or effects of PTSD, you should absolutely, um, if you can afford to and if it's safe for you to do so, mm -hmm. seek help, professional help, um, where you can um, talk, go to different therapies, and there are different ways of. Uh, um, of like looking at PTSD and treating it. Um, so, um, but we also think the PTSD support groups can be very helpful, right, um, Alison? Yeah, always. I mean, just the importance of having a community and not feeling as though your natural reactions to an abnormal experience somehow isolate you or detach you from relationships with others or experiences in your own life or community or meaning and value but then being able to talk to and engage with people who will understand what you're going through and validate the experiences of what you're feeling where you don't have to explain yourself over and over and over again 
because I think when you do access those spaces, you remember, remember, or um, at least I did, that you may have experienced trauma, you may still be dealing with the consequences of trauma, but the trauma also doesn't define you. And there are always ways that you can seek help where you can manage your symptoms and you will have resources available. Amazing. So what happens at this part of our usual session is that we have a time for questions. Obviously, our session sessions don't run live, um, though we may run some live. Yeah. Um, so we we will always give a link. There's a direct chat link with us. So then people, when they're watching the video at this point, they can send us their questions or thoughts. Um, you know, we learn with you as well. So if there might people might share things that we can include for the next video, we'll include them. And then we do a checkout. So um, in the checkout, we say, um, you know, we thank everyone for being in a session and showing up for yourself and, you know, uh, being here and knowing that you're not alone um, mm -hmm. and that we're all in this together. And then we do a breathing exercise. So mm -hmm. um, we do a grounding exercise, that's a breathing exercise together. So let's do that. So we'll breathe long, like breathe, inhale and exhale five, four, three, two, one. And then we let out a big sigh. So I want you to all do it uh, with us. So Alison and I will, I will show yeah. it and we'll- I'll follow um, your lead. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay, um, and then we ask people to name one positive thing uh, that you will take away with you from the session. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell us in chat, that would be amazing. We'd love to read it out and share what is the one positive thing that you would like to take away. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll wait for you to respond to that. So let's go to the next thing that we do. After that is we say, we ask people to repeat a feel good phrase for themselves and mm -hmm. say it out loud and really own these words. And I can see there are a few of them in the chat. So shall we go over them? So there's a really uh, amazing one, which is, I am more than I appear to be. All the world's strength and power rests inside of me. Hmm. That's amazing. That's so important. Yes. And uh, someone else said that trauma doesn't define them. That's mm -hmm. very, very profound. Yeah, repeating just that and reminding yourself of that, I think even as trauma intrudes in your day is so valuable. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, keep telling us what is the one positive thing that you will take away from the session. Mm -hmm. And then we ask people to do one good thing for themselves uh, during the week uh, for just themselves alone, which means that that is your moment of happiness. You're not, your children are not involved in it, your family isn't involved in it, your pets can be involved in it, but <laughs> may not. So, You're just saying that for you because you want to hang out with your cats all the time so um yeah so uh allison do you what is the one good thing that you'll do this week because you and you and i've been very busy alongside the bloom team right because mm -hmm. we've been busy launching this and working on uh, all this content for you so um what is your thing the positive thing that i'm going to take with me or the thing that i'm going to do i feel like i was, thing that I was you're going to do the thing that i'm going to do um my uh group of friends and I were originally before lockdown happened um, doing a book club that ended up like falling by the wayside. <laughs> My flatmate recommended a book that was supposed to be terrible that was purposely being recommended just because it would <laughs> like, like provoke very strange discussions. So I think I'm going to venture at it. It's <laughs> Narcissism and Goldman, which is like a German philosophy book about like the meaning of life and death but it's so masculine and male and like the women are only like strange little figures in it so i'm sure i'll be furious the whole time. but i'll i think I'll, I'll engage and read that and i don't know allow myself to be angry at these patriarchal models <laughs> <laughs> amazing mm -hmm. i see people saying things like um real things positive things to take away from the session realizing mm -hmm. i'm not alone um i like the reminder that it takes a long time to heal and be mm -hmm. patient with it um, yeah. love yourself take care of yourself 
um, we have always, we have already been resilient. I am um, mm-hmm. beautiful inside out, even with some scars on my soul. I am pure in whatever I do. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really profound. Um, so these are great things um, that you're all saying and taking away with you, but we really want to make sure you all do something good for yourself as well. Um, mm-hmm. And then what we do is we give an evaluation form. So mm-hmm. um, it's a very short form. Uh, we're not going to give it to you, but if you, if you were enrolled in the course, you would get it, <laughs> um, which helps us understand how we're doing, things we can improve, and it also helps us track like which weeks are hard for people and which weeks aren't, so we know what to uh, improve. So also we've got 10 minutes. Can you, uh, in these 10 minutes, uh, can we go over what courses are coming up and what those will cover? And if any of you have any questions about your, um, about whatever you've heard today, then ask away. Yeah, uh, as we wait for the questions to come in, I can talk about the five courses. So we have the first two of the five, which are launching on Tuesday of next week. So seven days from now, which is the 18th of August. Um, the first is for those who are coping with domestic abuse, whether or not you are still living with an abuser or you've left an abusive relationship, which can be with an intimate partner or even family. And that will be an eight week course. And then we have a separate course, which is on recovery from sexual violence. So if you have experienced assault, Uh, sexual trauma, or even had adverse childhood experiences, Mm -hmm. we will be going through in the same way as this course for both of them, coping mechanisms, uh, tricks to living a daily life, um, acknowledging the social conditions that have allowed this to happen and myth busting Mm -hmm. beliefs that might have kept you in a cycle of guilt or shame. And after that, we have three other courses, one of which is on trauma resilience. So we were talking about how you're already wired for resilience that the triggers that keep you in the state of alarm are actually ways that you've been trying to stay alive, but we want to be on them. So we talk through general trauma and those experiences and how we step back from that and build a sense of self and in our own identities, which is starting September 15th. And then we have two final courses on managing anxiety and creating boundaries, which are four weeks. Because I, I mentioned it briefly when we were talking about pushing stress back from your life putting boundaries in place and not taking on too much. But I know as a team, um, when we were trying to talk about what boundaries were, when we were going through writing the different courses. We all wanted to take the course. (laughs) Yeah. Like, it's so, it seems like such an abstract term of saying, like, pushing my boundaries. To me, it's like, for me, it was like, oh, is this like, I feel like at this phrase, I've only come across it in um, Instagram posts. So I yeah. was like, but then when you think about it deeper and you explain it and you're like, actually, I really need this because I struggle with saying no. I struggle with like telling people when they do something that upsets me and communicating that. Um, or, you know, I struggle with like, you know, uh, differentiating between work and life and like trying to you know manage that. So that that's what the course is going to be. And we couldn't find a course or like any guides about it online. So we decided to create it ourselves. So that would be interesting. And I think it's worth saying that you can attend all of those courses and they're all free. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really, you know, um, it's really open to like how, however many courses you want. Um, and they're available on WhatsApp or Telegram. But each one does end up with a homework. So that means that you know, it's not just passive listening, you're not just listening to us, we expect you to do something that helps you in that journey of recovery, and that you set aside some time for that. Although we're always mindful when we do assign the homework, that it's helpful. It's meant yeah. to help you engage in the practice rather than overload you. Yeah, uh, it's not, you, no one's going to ask you to write an essay. No. About, <laughs> no. About but, uh, just no. from the question on the side, we are being asked if this recording will be available. Uh, yeah. Yes. So we're recording everything. We put it up. We actually did another webinar um, just, what, two weeks ago? Time moves too fast, which yeah, was... I think it was last week, week, actually. Was it? I think so. Yeah. No, no, it was the week before. Yeah. So you'll remember. Yeah. It, it repeats some of the concepts we went over here, just talking again about the fear responses and how anxiety taps into those same things. But we also talk about the difference between anxiety and fear and how we remind ourselves that anxiety isn't real danger yeah 
exactly. Uh, we're saying it was two weeks ago. There we yeah, go. So, <laughs> I have lost all sense of time. It's too hot. It's too hot for me. And there's too much cat hair around me. And I've just, if you saw me picking out my eyes, it's because cat hair kept coming in it. And I was like <laughs> trying to get it out. Um, so yeah, cats are lovely. When, when you bury your head in the fur, um, mm -hmm. some cat fur remains. So um, that's really it for our session. Um, we had a lot to cover, but we're glad we were able to get it all. And, you know, if you have any feedback for us about, you know, whether this was useful um, and if you think that our courses would be useful for you or someone else, you know, or if you are part of any mailing list or you think, you know, I'll just share it, um, please do. Uh, mm -hmm. We're very keen that this helps as many people as it can and we really appreciate your great feedback we're reading it mm. um and yeah we're going to close the webinar now so you'll get the recording uh, on youtube and we hope that you have a great day tiffany has posted some links that uh means that you can stay in touch with all that we do and mm -hmm. we've got your email addresses so we'll follow up with the link to the recording and uh, all the links that tiffany has posted so it's a goodbye from us and thank you so much for being present yes. and listening and engaging and giving your time, attention and focus, because those things are always such gifts and we don't take it for granted. And okay. hope we see more from you soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye.